For analysis of this final week of the Iowa campaign, we turn now to our Politics Monday team. That is Amy Walter of the Cook Political Report with Amy Walter and Tamara Keith of NPR. Great to see you both. Hello. Hello. So let's look at where the landscape is right now for the candidates in Iowa as we talk about this last week of Iowa campaigning. The latest Des Moines Register NBC News Iowa poll shows Mr. Trump with a commanding lead. There's 51 percent of likely GOP caucus goers saying they'll support him, 19 percent for Mr. DeSantis, 16 percent for Haley. 5% for Vivek Ramaswamy and 4% for former Governor Chris Christie. Amy, we talk a lot about DeSantis and Haley and what's at stake here for them in this first contest. What does a win look like for them in Iowa? Yeah, well, obviously a win at this point doesn't look like an actual win. Right. Um, not only is uh, Trump ahead, it looks like, by about 30 points in all the polls that we've seen for these last few weeks. But if he won by that margin, that would be the biggest margin that any competitive Republican caucus winner has come out of Iowa with. 50% um, would also be a statement because for weeks now, well, not for weeks, for the entire campaign, his rivals have made the case that there is a base of support for Donald Trump, but there's a bigger base of support for people who are willing to look beyond Donald Trump, whether they are truly voters on the Republican side who don't want to see Donald Trump or people who are ready to maybe turn the page even though they do like Donald Trump. With 50 percent of the vote, that would sort of close the door on that. The folks I talk to in the state, they do see a real fight for second place, mm -hmm. that Nikki Haley has had a great deal of momentum. We haven't seen polls since the holidays, so it's unclear whether some of this back and forth that we're seeing with she and Trump is having um, an impact. But I think that for uh, Ron DeSantis, he has the most at stake, uh, certainly, because he has the endorsements and he's really ba banked his entire campaign on doing well in Iowa. Losing, whether it's by 10 or 20 or 30 points, it's hard to turn that into a win. Tam, is this existential for Ron DeSantis? He has done the full Grassley. He's gone to all 99 counties. He has moved most of his campaign operation to Iowa. He came in with such incredibly high expectations that if he then comes in third place in Iowa, that is existential. That is a major problem for his going campaign. Now, he had a, a press call with reporters today, and he said, I've got plans for things that I'm going to be doing in New Hampshire. I've got events in New Hampshire. I've got events in South Carolina. I've got events in Nevada. He's got plans, but plans can change. Absolutely, plans can change if it doesn't go well for him. Well, one and of the key he doesn't have yeah. money, by the way. Right, He's not right. investing money in the ads in those states in the way that the Haley campaign and her supporters are. Another key yeah. part of any campaign. But one, the huge lead we see Mr. Trump having right there is in large part due to this key block we talk mm -hmm. a lot about in Iowa, which is those white evangelicals in the state. It hasn't always been that way, though. He hasn't always had their support. Back in 2016, it was about 22 percent of evangelicals said they would support him. That is now up to 51 percent. Ham, how do you look at those numbers? How did he get that kind of support growth? Okay, so in 2016, he was talking about two Corinthians, and it sounded like a not a Bible verse, but like a joke about a bar. Uh, and now he is the person who uh, put on the Supreme Court uh, a conservative majority that overturned Roe versus Wade and gave evangelical Christians the Dobbs decision. I mean. What more does he need to do? Um, and also, I think that uh, that absolutely, as as that one voter said, they're not looking for him to be their pastor. Right. Um, but you know, part of Christianity is forgiveness, uh, and I think that a lot of his sort of personal sins have been forgiven by these voters. Amy, how do you look at that? It's also that when we talk about being evangelical, for many folks who describe themselves as evangelical, it's less about their religious views than their political views, mm -hmm. and. Uh, being a white evangelical and being a supporter of Trump have now become s synonymous. Uh, so that, yes, I do think the, the Dobbs case and delivering on some of those issues matters a lot, but it's also the fact that they see that their identity, their cultural identity, somebody who's fighting for them, we talk you talked, I think, in the piece about grievance politics, mm -hmm. the sense that this is a group of people who are under siege by the left and the only person standing up for them is Donald Trump. That's a message that resonates. Right.
among the other messages that resonate, though, we have seen uh, from Mr. Trump this sort of strain of revisionist history in these closing messages before Iowa, not just looking back to three years ago and the January 6th um, insurrection. He calls the people who carried out the violent attack patriots and hostages and said they should all be pardoned, but going back to the Civil War. And we are now talking about the root cause of the Civil War. Somehow that's up for debate. You heard Mr. Biden, President Biden, reference this explicitly in his speech in South Carolina at the Mother Emanuel AME Church today. Just take a listen to what he said. Let me be clear for those who don't seem to know, slavery was the cause of the Civil War. There is no negotiation about that. Now, now we're living in an era of a second lost cause. Once again, there's some in this country trying, trying to turn a loss into a lie. I mean, this conversation is not about policy or politics. We're talking about whose version of history you're going to believe. That's exactly right. And that's the through line that the president was trying to make here between a debate about the Civil War, which seems like that had been um, delegated uh, many years ago, uh, or the fight of, had been over many years ago, to now, which is um, his point being, if you're going to lie about the cause of the Civil War, as had we had seen, whether it's a, the, calling it the noble cause, and you're going to lie about the election results, lie about what happened on January 6th, those things share one thing in common, especially for black voters. They are denying your voice. What uh, the, the president was saying at, at, from the pulpit today was, when he says that the election was stolen, what Donald Trump is telling the, you, the voters in these pulpits, many of whom uh, saw your grandparents and your parents denied the right to vote, he's saying your vo voice and your vote doesn't matter. Tam, that's why we hear this as a centerpiece of his campaign, not necessarily his record, right? No, he uh, certainly, he is going to talk about his record. Yeah. Don't worry, yeah. we're going to hear a lot more about Bidenomics or whatever they call it next. However, his campaign is very much centered on what America do you want? What America do you want to see? And he is making an argument that Donald Trump and other Republicans, you know, the MAGA Republicans, as he calls them, that, that they have a different vision of America and that it is anti-democratic. And so that is very clearly becoming the centerpiece of President Biden's campaign. He is drawing a through line uh, from Charlottesville and and what happened at Mother Emanuel right through to January 6th, saying it's about extremism and political violence and that that isn't something that Americans sh should stand for. And th there is some indication that actually a lot of Americans agree with that. Um, and he is trying to build a coalition of people who don't want the history of January 6th revised. Mm -hmm. um, they may not necessarily want uh, the policies he's selling, um, and, and that's what he's trying to thread. And also, it's, it's worth noting that he went to South Carolina. That's the state that will hold the first Democratic primary. That's right. Um, it's all about black voters, uh, which are a group of voters that he needs in his base um, and that he has struggled with somewhat, though you wouldn't know it uh, from the call and response there uh, at Mother Emanuel. Well, let's remember caucuses are different than like showing up to vote or, or rallies. Yeah. It's all about who turns up on the day. Just yeah. in the last few seconds we have left, what's the one thing you're watching for? Well, in the, this weather last is, week? the weather is important. It's supposed to be very, very cold there. I know Iowans are very, very hardy. But when you look at uh, the last polls, say that Fox News did, the people said they were most most committed to showing up and voting were Ron DeSantis supporters, actually. This could matter in terms of who comes in second, um, is uh, folks who are willing to, to brave really, really cold weather. <laughs> what are you yeah, watching, Tim? I'm watching the ground game uh, and, and what they do to get people to turn out in that very cold weather. What I'm also watching is, let's say Trump does win, which by all indications he will, does he win by a lot, mm -hmm. or does he win by a small enough margin that it gives Nikki Haley and Ron DeSantis some, you know, some jet fumes to go on? We'll know in a week. Yes. Tamara Keith, Amy Walter, thank you both. Thank You're you. welcome. You're welcome.